Okay, this is Physics 1A for May 20th. Today we're basically going to be talking about gravitational potential energy. That's the main topic for today, and we're going to use it to solve these problems that are over here to the right. Um, so, gravitational potential energy. Let's get started. So let's think about uh, what we learned last time. Um, we learned that if you have two objects, um, and you call them like mass 1 and mass 2, and there's some distance apart that you call like R or something like that. We learned about new the Newton force of gravity, that the force of gravity is a force that's going to act uh, on each of these objects. Uh, it's an attractive force. And the force of gravity is dependent upon the size of the masses. Right? So you take one mass, you multiply by the other mass, you multiply by the gravitational constant G, and then you divide by R squared. And G is just kind of a proportionality constant in order to make this definition of force equivalent to the other definition of the force that we have, which is that force is related to mass times acceleration. Um, if you think about the way that the force is defined, the unit for force is a newton, right? And a newton is basically equal to a kilogram multiplied by a meter per second squared. That's our definition of what a newton is, right? Without this constant g, you could, you could technically have defined the newton in a different way. Like, suppose that constant g wasn't there and that we learned about gravitational force before we learned about the relationship between force and acceleration, then you could say that we, we could have defined uh, one Newton to be equal to a kilogram squared divided by a meter squared. And that if you took two masses that were one kilogram and placed them one meter apart from each other, you could, you could have defined that to be what a Newton is, the force between them. Does that make sense to you guys? That, that's, that's, it's perfectly acceptable to have defined the Newton like this, right? Do you guys know what I mean? Is what I'm saying clear? Okay. But we need this constant G to basically fix the problem. That, that this is not what we had called units before, right? So, so then G automatically gets the units of Newton times meter squared divided by kg squared so that you get a Newton out of this, right? And um, I mention this because... It's it's really these these are really two different definitions of what force are right, and they're also two different definitions of what mass is. If you think about it, because in this definition of mass, what we call inertial mass, it describes the fact that objects that have mass, uh, when you put a force on them, they gain a certain acceleration, and the larger they are, the less acceleration you get. Right, this type of mass, though, I would call gravitational mass. Right? Because this type of mass describes, um, you know, the force between two objects, depending on how heavy they are, or how, how massive they are, sorry. So it's really two different definitions of mass. As far as we know, as far as we know, these two things are equivalent to each other. Um, but uh, that's just our current understanding, is that gravitational mass and inertial mass are exactly the same. We may be wrong about that. I don't know. There's something wrong with uh, our theory of the universe right now, and, 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 and one of the biggest problems is this thing called dark matter that we're going to get to eventually. But part, maybe, maybe within this connection here, we're missing something. That maybe there really is a difference between these two types of masses, and we don't really understand it yet. But as far as we know, this type of mass creates the gravitational force, and it also creates uh, effectively inertial forces. And, um, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about gravitational potential energy. What we want to do is we want to think about this force and we want to describe a type of energy associated with it. And what we know is that work and energy are related to each other. So if we can figure out something like the following, like let's say that we take a planet, okay? And let's say that planet has a mass that we call M. And let's say that it has uh, some radius that we call capital R. And let's say that we have a body near this planet. Like let's say we've got a satellite or something like that. So I've got a satellite right here. And let's say that, uh, for whatever reason, I want to take this satellite, okay, and I want to take it from some position right here. Wait, let's use a different color for that. So it, it's going to start off at some position like right here, and I'm going to label this as a vector, and I'm going to call it uh, R initial. And let's say we want to take that satellite and we want to move it along a path, um, path, uh, kind of in this direction, just in a straight line to keep things simple. So we want to move it along a path like that so that it moves in a straight line away from the planet um, and ends up at a place like this. Now, how that occurs, well, 
we talk about that later, I guess, but um, maybe there's some rocket fuel and you use it to, uh, uh, to move away from the planet, okay? And you want to move it from this location to this location over here. So it's going to start off at some initial position R sub I, and it's going to move to another position that we call R sub F. And we're going to say that it moves in a straight line, okay? So this is its initial position, that's its final position. And the thing we want to work on here is we want to ask the question, what's the work done by the gravitational force? What's the work done by gravity, effectively? And to do this, um, we're going to need to know what the mass of this guy is. We'll call that mass M. We're calling this mass big M. And what we can say is that if I want to find the work that's done on this object, uh, what I really need to do is to label the force. So the force on this object is going to be pulling back towards the center of the planet. That's the, that's the type of force that we're going to have here. And the force, what's going to happen to it as we move along this path? Is the force going to be constant along that path? Is it going to change? What do you guys think? Is it going to get weaker? Is it going to get stronger? What's going to happen as we pull these objects far away? And you can kind of look at that equation right there uh, to see. It gets weaker, yeah. It gets weaker as the object goes away, right? You get farther away from the planet, you don't feel the influence of the planet as much, right? The closer you are, you're kind of stuck in this gravitational well. So that means that there's going to still be a force over here. It's just going to be kind of smaller. You can call it FG prime or something like that. But the point is, that force, it's not constant. It changes, right? It changes. And because it changes, um, when we calculate the work, the work done by the force of gravity, um, we need to do an integral, basically, of that force. And we take the dot product with the displacement dr. Okay. Now, dr is basically a vector that, that kind of points in the same direction as our path. So I would say that dr basically points along that direction there. It points in a direction opposite to the force of gravity, which means that if I want to evaluate this dot product here, fg dot dr, well, there's there's an angle of 180 degrees between the two of them, and we know that the dot product is basically equal to the magnitude of the first thing, fg, uh, times the magnitude of the second thing, dr, and then you just need to multiply by the cosine of the angle between those two uh, vectors, right? In this case, that cosine is 180 degrees, which means that what we're going to get here is just basically negative integral of fg, now we can plug fg in if we want to. fg, as seen above right here, is going to be big G times the mass of the satellite times the mass of the planet, and then we divide by the distance between the planet and the satellite at any moment squared, and from there we um, we multiply again by dr, right? So we just replaced the force inside of this equation. We got a negative sign due to the cosine 180, right? And now we just do this integral. Assuming that the mass of our, our spaceship or our satellite doesn't change, not exactly the best assumption because if in fact the satellite is going to move from this location to this location, unless it already had some velocity, its mass needs to change to move from one location to the other because that's how we move things in space. I don't know if you guys know this, but there's nothing to push off of in space. So you literally have to push off your own fuel. You have to shoot fuel at the back of the engine so that you can move forwards in the same way that if you're on an ice skating rink and you threw a medicine ball away from yourself, you'd go in the opposite direction, right? That's effectively how we move things in space is we just shoot fuel out um, so, so, so I'm going to say that the mass is going to be constant here of the object, but uh, uh, unfortunately that's not realistic in any type of real rocket or, or real space vessel. So we're going to basically pull out the negative g, uh, little m, and then big M we can definitely pull out because it's the mass of a planet. That shouldn't be changing for any reason. And we multiply by the integral of dr over r squared. And then we go with our limits here. So our limits are going to be r initial up to r final, like that. And then we just evaluate this integral. What's that integral going to be equal to here? Stuff like this is where it's like, why on earth don't they expect you to do calculus too before you take this class? <laughs> like, I mean, this is technically from Calc 3, right? Line integrals are technically from Calc 3, right? Uh, GMM over R, yes, that's exactly what we're going to get. So we're going to get G times little m times big M multiplied by 1 over R. Uh, there's a negative sign right here. The integral of 1 over r squared is negative 1 over r, so the negatives cancel basically, right? And we evaluate that between our two limits of r sub i magnitude and r sub f magnitude. Notice that I'm not plugging these in as vectors, I'm plugging them as, uh, you know. All right. Does that make sense to you guys? The work done by gravity appears to be proportional to gravitational constant, the mass of the object, and the mass of the planet. Um, so those two have to be part of it. And then you have to multiply by 1 over the radius. Plugging these values in, we end up getting that the work done by gravity uh, is equal to 
um, it's going to be g times little m times big M times 1 over r final minus 1 over r initial. And if r final is larger than r initial, then this will be positive. Wait, what would it be? r initial is negative. It's the smaller one. No, no, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. In this case, when you're moving from this location to this, this location, the work done by gravity is negative, right? Because our initial is going to be, 1 over our initial is going to be a bigger quantity. So this whole thing is going to end up being negative. If the object were to be moving from here in that direction, the work done by gravity is positive. If the, you're moving in this direction, the work done by gravity is, uh, is going to be negative. So it's negative in this direction, and it's positive in this direction. So gravity does positive work when you fall inwards towards the planet, negative work when you try to pull away from the planet, which should make sense because you effectively have to do work against gravity to get out of the gravitational well of the planet. So that's the work done by gravity. Whoops. Now our goal is to get to gravitational potential energy. That's that's kind of what we're starting with here, right? Can anyone tell me if I know the work done by a force and I also know that it's a quote conservative force, how do I relate the work done by the force to the change in potential energy of the force? Do you guys remember that? No, nope, that's not right. How do I relate it to the potential energy, not the kinetic energy? Close, but what's the exact relationship? Yeah, yes, delta UG. So what's the relationship between the work done and delta UG? Is it equal to it? Is it something else? Nope, that's not what I'm asking. No, 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 no. I'm asking in general, if I have, an, if I have a conservative force and I want to know how the change of potential energy, uh, it's a negative, exactly. There's a negative sign here. Any conservative force, whether it be a spring, an electric force, or a gravitational force, uh, the work done by that conservative force is always equal to the negative change in potential energy, basically. So that's that's what we need to throw in here is another negative sign. And the reason for this is that basically you, you need to have a change of potential energy as you move from this location to this location. And if you think about it, like when you lift an object, just let's go to the MGY thing that Ash mentioned. If I lift an object from the surface of the Earth, okay, this is Earth, and I lift an object up in this direction, what happens to the change of potential energy? It's, uh, it's greater than zero, right? Like, if I take this object and I move it upwards, it gains potential energy. That's what I mean by this, right? I think you guys would all agree with that statement. You gain energy when you go this way. But at the same time, gravity acts in this direction, right? But the path, or your dr, is this way, right? So that means they're opposite directions, which means the work done by gravity, when you lift the object up, is less than zero. So that's where that relationship comes from there, okay? This is extremely important in physics, and it's extremely important you understand it because it gets kind of thrown in willy-nilly in, in classes like 1C, like where you're going to be expected to really understand what this means. So just always think about like a picture like this. Just think about the fact that when you lift an object up, it gains energy, but you're doing work against gravity, right? So when you gain energy, it's because you've done work against gravity, and that's why that negative sign shows up right there. The same thing happens in 1C. It's way more confusing in 1C because instead of talking about work and energy, you start talking about um, what's called uh, EMF and voltage. And it just, it just immediately becomes really complicated, but I promise you 100% it's exactly the same as what we're describing here. All right. So we know that the work done by gravity is equal to the negative change of potential energy. So we could write this in the following way. So let me go black. We could write this in the following way. Negative delta UG would be like negative UF minus U initial, right? U, again, is potential energy, right? So what we have basically is basically G little m big M over R final minus little m, or sorry, G m m over R initial is equal to the negative of U final minus U initial, okay? And now you can investigate both sides and say, okay, well, if I want to know what U final is, the easiest thing for me to do would be to move the negative sign over to this side of the equation, make that one positive, basically multiply both sides by a negative sign, and then distribute, right? And then what you end up getting is basically negative GMM over R final minus, and now I'm going to throw negative negative in here. I hope this doesn't confuse you guys too much. Right? Okay. Can you see the similarity on both sides? You've got final, final, you've got a minus sign, you've got a minus sign, and you've got initial, and you've got initial. So it must be the case that basically this term and this term have to be equivalent, and that term and that term have to be equivalent, which means we get an answer for what the potential energy due to gravity is, 
the potential energy due to gravity is going to be equal to the negative. If the negative sign is important in this case. It has to be negative. Uh, big G times the mass of the planet times the mass of the body that is orbiting the planet divided by the distance between the center of mass of the planet and the center of mass of the object. And that is the potential energy due to gravity. This is the most general definition of the potential energy due to gravity. That right there. Negative big G mm over R. Okay. Notice that it is a little bit different, just a little bit different than the force, right? There's only one difference, or two, I guess. There's the negative sign. You have to remember that part. And you've got uh, the R squared down here for, for force. So for force, it's R squared. For energy, it's just divided by R. From a dimensional perspective, that should make sense because, you know, energy is Newton meters. This is Newtons. So divide by one less R, you get Newton meters. Okay. That's our potential energy due to gravity. We'll talk about why it's negative, and we'll do some plots here, and we'll use problems and solve it and stuff like that. But um, this is the more general definition of potential energy due to gravity. The one that I told you before, the MGY, is a special case that only applies when you're near the surface of a planet. Okay? This one applies everywhere. Everywhere. If you have multiple masses, like if there's two stars and you want to figure out energy in that system with a third object, you would sum the energies of, of each of those. That's getting a little complex. All right, do you guys have any questions? This one, this one works everywhere. The one I gave you before, so this is the, this is the more universal definition. Uh, this one, UG equal to MGY, this works only near the surface. Technically, you could, you could use the one right here above. All right, I'll show you how. I'll show you how they're equivalent to each other, but I want to, yeah, let's do that. We might as well, right? So take a planet, right? And say this is the radius of our planet right here, right? And in fact, let's use Earth, right? And now take an object, and let's say that we move it through some small change in height, uh, not so high that we actually leave the surface of the planet, but we basically, we start off here at some position R initial, and we go to here at some position R final. These are technically vectors. And we're gonna say that the, the height here, we'll, we'll just call that H, okay? and say that that's equal to some y final minus y initial or something like that, where y is defined relative to the surface. So this would be like y initial, and then that would be y final. A lot of arrows here, okay, but we kind of need all this stuff to actually do it. So the object travels along a path from there to there, right? It has a mass little m, and I want to calculate the change in energy, but we're going to do it using that definition right there, okay? So we would say that the change in potential energy for this object should be equal to negative G times little m times big M divided by R final um, minus negative G m m over R initial, okay? Okay, so it's basically negative G little m big M times 1 over our final minus 1 over our initial. But this R final if you look at the things that are happening in this picture right here, let's see, R final how do we want to do this? It's equal to something like the radius of the Earth plus y final, and r initial is equal to the radius of the Earth plus uh, y initial. Oh, is this going to work out? Maybe I need to define it in terms of h. It might work out. Yeah, let's just see what happens. What's the worst that can happen? 
Does that look right to you guys, though? It's the radius of the Earth plus Y initial, and the radius of the Earth plus Y final. Yep, that looks right. Okay, so we get 1 over radius of Earth plus Y final minus 1 over the radius of the Earth plus Y initial. This has to work. You know what? It just has to. Like, there's no way it doesn't work, right? Let's see. I'm very confident about this. All right, what do we have to do here? Well, if I want to add these together, um, I'm going to have to do something like this. Uh, radius of the Earth uh, plus Y initial minus radius of the Earth plus Y final divided by radius of Earth. I'm just, I'm just combining the denominators here. That look right to you guys? You guys see what I did? I just combined the denominators, right? And, uh, oh, there we go. That's gotta be like that. That look okay to you guys? What do I do next? What do you, what, what, happen, what happens next? What do you guys notice here? Yep, the R's cancel. Yep. This one and this one cancel. What else could I do? I'm going to do something that may not be super obvious to you, but I think some of you are probably thinking about it. What if I tell you this? What if I said that Y final was, let's say, like 100 meters, and I tell you that Y initial is like 10 meters? What could we do? What's the radius of the Earth? Is it on the order of 100 meters? 6,400 kilometers, exactly. So it's about 6.4 times 10 to the 6th meters, right? What can we do? What do you guys think? What can I do? To simplify this. What can I do to simplify the denominator in particular? Treat them as zero. Exactly. Because if you take the radius of the Earth plus 10 meters and the radius of the Earth plus 100 meters, it's basically nothing, right? It affects the, like... You know, 6.400 0, 0, times 10 to the 6th, basically, meters. We're not even there, because 10 meters is way off, right? The Ys are extremely small compared to R. Yeah, exactly, that's right. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the radius of the Earth is significantly bigger than this, the radius of the Earth is significantly bigger than this, which is effectively the assumption we're making here, because I want to prove that, you know. So I'm basically going to make it so that the, the denominator basically just becomes the radius of the Earth squared, okay? And then we're going to multiply the negative sign through, and we're going to end up getting g times little m times big M uh, divided by the radius of the Earth squared. Okay, multiplied by... Now I multiply the negative sign through here, and now it becomes y final minus y initial. Okay, we're getting really close now, right? What do I need to do next? You guys notice anything from what we learned last time in this particular... in this equation here that I can... that I can... I can call something else that we have a different name for? What is... what is that? What's that whole thing? g m m over r e squared? Is that related to anything? We did this derivation yesterday, I don't know if you, or Monday, I don't know if you. It's the force, right? It's the force of gravity, right? But you know that the force of gravity is equivalent to what? This is one way to write it, but what's the other way to write it? Mg, exactly. Mg. Mg, because little g, we proved last time, was equal to big G times the mass of the planet divided by the radius of the planet, and you have to square it, right? So this whole thing is basically m times g times y final minus y initial. That is delta ug. That's our that's that's how you prove that it's equivalent to this statement up here. That's pretty neat, I think. I have to make a little bit of an assumption. What was the assumption we made? We made the assumption that the height 
was insignificant relative to the radius of the Earth. Because that's the only time that this is true. you got to be near the surface, right? As soon as you start moving, like for example, let's say you wanted to project a rocket off the top of the planet, and you wanted to start on the North Pole, and you wanted to launch it to a distance that's like equal to the radius of the Earth above the planet. You know what I mean? You want to go basically from the surface to a distance where you're the radius, at least the distance, uh, like 6,400 kilometers away from the surface. Well, then you couldn't make this assumption anymore, right? And that's where you need to use the more general version right here. Okay. So keep that in mind. Uh, every time you're dealing with uh, problems where you're, you're dealing with a situation where you're in outer space, you're going to need to use this guy. But if you're near the surface of the planet, like objects rolling down inclined planes and that kind of thing, or roller coasters, this one's totally fine. Very good approximation near the surface of the planet. All right. So there you go. Um, we can now use this oh we have to prove the angular momentum thing too do we? I don't know if we need to prove it or not but we probably should we do it really quickly actually ah, there's so much. There's so many things we gotta talk about actually we need to talk more about this let's talk more about that equation because I, I, we haven't said why it's negative does anyone know why it's negative? why would the energy due to gravity be negative? that's kind of weird right? I mean we've, we've dealt with potential energies that have been negative before, right? I mean, you can define y to be whatever you want, and if, if, if y is a negative quantity, then, well, then that would be negative, but um, but why is it particularly negative in this case? So let's use let's use a shape so I can actually draw a real. So let's take a, uh, we'll take that, and I don't really need all that stuff, I just need this. And then we're going to take um, the planet, so this is going to be the Earth, this is going to be the Earth right here. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Put it right Kind of in the center right there. So um, this is this is Earth, and the radius of the Earth. Um, so this is going to be the r direction. And we're basically going to plot potential energy due to gravity, uh, basically as a function of r, where we know the value of it is negative big G little m big M divided by r. Okay. So mass of the planet is m. And then, right, so what does this look like? Well, it's a pretty simple uh, kind of thing. Um, so it's basically going to start right here at the surface of the planet. And at that moment, you're going to have some negative value. Let's use orange, I guess. You're going to have some negative value down here. And the energy due to gravity is going to basically follow a curve like this. The farther away you get, it asymptotically approaches zero. Um, but that's basically what it looks like. Okay. Now, when I plot these potential energy functions, I have to kind of like, in my mind, think about what I'm actually doing here. Oh, and I guess one other thing we could say is that at this location here, the energy is, like on the surface, right? The energy is basically negative g little m big M divided by the radius of the planet, right? So if the radius of the planet is big R, that's the value at the surface. And then as you move farther and farther away, it gets weaker. It becomes less negative, basically, right? So why is it negative? What's the negative sign mean? What do you guys know about negative energy? Have you seen negative energy in any of, the, any of your other classes? Are you sure? Anybody else? Anybody else? You have, I promise you. Energy is released. Energy is released. What do you mean by energy is released? No, that's not it. No. Uh, Energy can be transferred, that's right. But have you ever seen energy that was negative in any of your, any of your other classes? Uh, work, can, you, work can be negative, sure. I'm thinking outside of physics, though. Because I don't. up to this point, we haven't really talked about negative energy. Um, gravity pulls you towards Earth, then negative would propel you away. So, it's in chemistry, yes. Uh, if So, gravity pulls towards Earth, right? That's part of the reason why it's negative, is because it's an attractive force, actually. But somewhere in chemistry, you have probably experienced negative energy. You should have at some point. I'm not talking about change. I'm not talking about change. The value of this is actually negative. I'm not talking about changes. Like, the actual value is negative, okay? And to talk about changes in energy, if you move in this direction, your energy becomes less negative or more negative, right? Anyway, sorry. Uh, I'm talking about electrons, yes. Not charges, but electrons. What do you learn about in chemistry involving electrons? 
No. It doesn't have to do with negative charge. Don't you in chemistry talk about um, when a photon of energy is released from an atom and you want to calculate how much is released? Um, I mean, I'll just put the equation down and maybe you'll recognize it. It looks something like this. Yes. Does this look like... I don't know if that's the equation. I can't remember. I know it's like 1 over like like one quantum number minus the other quantum number squared or something like that. So something like this. Um, and, and, and I think, it, like in the case of a, a nucleus and an electron, I think it has Planck's constant in it, maybe. When you have an electron that's orbiting uh, an atom like this, um, there's, there's different, quote, energy levels. You guys remember the energy levels thing? This is what I'm just... And do you remember, like, like the values of them? If you go, if you go, if you go like, read about it, what you find is that um, the energy in this case starts off as negative. So it's, like, in, in, in like, the, in the ground state, like, n equal to 1, you have an energy, I think it's called E1, that ends up being something like negative 13.6 electron volts or something like that. And then as you, as you move to, like, the n equal to 2 state, uh, that is to say when the electron basically goes to another, god, this looks awful. I'm trying to do this quickly. When the electron moves up to, so like if this is the n equal to one state and this is the n equal to two state, um, the energy at level two, I think, is this divided by four, which would be something like, I don't know what, this 14 over four is like. You're learning about this in 1D right now? Yeah. So it, 13, negative 13.6 is like negative, what, 12 over four is three, so it's gonna be a little more than three. It's probably something like, I don't know, 3.5 volts or something like that, approximately, I don't really know. Okay, but it's negative energy, okay? It's negative energy. The thing is that energy, is negative when you're talking about bound, bound, bleh, bound systems. And I don't know if you believe me on this, but basically I, I promise you that, um, that the energy values for these like levels, if you go back and look in your chemistry book, you'll, you'll see that it's, that they're negative basically, right? Um, in any bound system, whether it be like a, a body that's kind of orbiting around a planet or an electron that's orbiting a nucleus or something like that, the energy is always negative. And it's because we consider this type of energy a binding energy. And it represents, um, you know, let, let's say that I have a system, okay? And I take a mass, and I put a mass orbiting it at some distance r, right? It's going around in a circle here, right? And I tell you something like the, the energy of this system, let's say, is like negative, uh, I don't know, 1 times 10 to the 9 joules or something like that, right? I tell you that that's how much energy we have. Is at, at this radius, this massive object here, there's a, there's a there's a binding energy between these two objects, right? And what that energy represents is the amount of energy you would need to put into the system to rip this mass away from the other mass. Does that make sense? So you need to give this body uh, enough kinetic energy, for example, so that its kinetic energy was equivalent to this. And if you do that, it can escape from the system. Does that make sense? It's a binding energy, and the negative is there to represent the fact that you need to put that much energy into the system to pull these two objects apart from each other. Okay? Does that make sense? It's a type of binding energy. Does, does that make any sense to you guys? This bothered me a lot when I was uh, learning physics, because it's like, why is this negative sign here? Like it represents a binding energy. Same thing's true of the electrons, by the way. This is the amount of energy you have to put into the system to rip the electron out, basically, right? I don't know what they talk about in chemistry at the school. I'm not, I'm not trying to pretend anything like that, but I know for a fact that when you take classes, most of you guys forget everything as soon as the class ends. So it's like, that's what I'm saying. Like, go back and look in your chemistry book. I promise you that those energy values are negative. And it might not have bothered you at the time. And maybe your teacher just didn't emphasize it or whatever. I, I don't, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know what you guys learn. I just... I learned this in high school chemistry, so I, I just, anyway, uh, I just, I just want to kind of emphasize that the negative sign is there due to a binding energy and the negative sign is important. Okay. It is important. And the way you can think about this, by the way, to understand something about this is imagine I have an object, um, and like, let's just put a ball on this little curve right here, right? Oh, I misread what Ash said. Oh, you're saying they did talk about it and you just forgot. Yeah, right. 
So imagine I put a ball right here, and instead of thinking of this curve as just like a, a line that represents the energy, if I just put a ball and I set it on a surface and the surface was shaped like this, right, what would the ball do? It would, it would, it would roll down like this, right? I don't know. That's how I view these, these pictures is like, if I was to place a ball right here, it would, it would, it would move down towards the earth and it would accelerate along the way because the shape of this like, little hill right here, right, it, the slope is getting increasingly more steep, right? So, I don't know. That's how I think about these, these gravitational wells. Um, you could draw it on both sides too, and you would get something that might remind you of uh, Einstein, meaning that if I take that same picture right there, and instead of um, instead of just drawing one side of it, I drew both sides of it, it would look something like this, right? You'd have something like this, and now what you can imagine is you could take these two curves and you could rotate them around in a circle like this, and you'd basically create like a, I don't know, what does that look like to you guys? It looks like to me the, um, when I used to go to the, go ahead, Cam, you're going to type something. When you go to, um, when I used to go to this Walmart back in Oklahoma, and they'd have one of these things that was shaped exactly like this. It was just this, like, little tube-looking thing, and it had a hole in the bottom, and you put a coin, like, right here, and the coin would basically just go around in circles and spiral its way into the middle. You guys know what I'm talking about? Have you guys seen this before? Doesn't that look exactly the same? That's what gravity is, basically. This is our modern theory of what gravity is. We say that the massive object warps the space around it, and it creates this kind of, like, curvature, such that if, if you're, like, the moon over here, and this is the Earth back here, right? What the moon does is it basically just... It's traveling uh, in a straight line in a curved space, basically, is the idea. And you can kind of see it off this gravitational potential energy curve. Even though this curve doesn't represent space or time or anything like that. Well, I guess it, does, it represents space in this sense, but it's energy over here, right? So, yep. So matter does work on space. I would not go that far. I don't know. I don't know what that would mean that matter does work on space. I mean, it definitely bends it, but whether that is a type of work, I've never really thought about that way. That's interesting. It might be. We just think that it alters the properties of space. I might not even be saying that right. Honestly, I don't. I don't understand general relativity very well, to be honest. I just, I, I, I never did. It's extremely complicated, and I took a class in it, but like, <laughs> I don't really understand it. All right, we're getting, getting off topic a little bit. Not really, but just I kind of want to share so many things. Yeah, exactly. What you're showing there. Thank you. Basically that. Except that that's a sheet, but that's that's a good representation of the way gravity works. Um. I'm specifically talking... You guys know what I mean with the coin thing? Do they have those around here? It's called like a black hole or something like that. I know you guys must have seen this before somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. Very good representation of what gravity does. Very good. There's one at your local mall. Yep. The Galleria. Nice. So I, I want to do a problem, but I want to tell you guys something else about orbits real quick. Um, we learned about Kepler's uh, second law last time, right? And Kepler's second law said, suppose that I have an orbit... And suppose that I have my, whoops, uh, suppose that I have my sun over here at one of the foci, right? We learned that that's the way orbits work, is you have the sun at one of the foci, and then you have a planet, you know, over here. And then if we connect a line between the two of them, let me uh, get this line to look like kind of good. We said that Kepler's third law basically said that um, as the planet moves to another location, like for example here, if I again draw another line between those two guys and, um, and, and find the area that's swept out, we learn that um, the area basically right here, um, this area vector, or not area vector, sorry, this area in here was, was a constant uh, in terms of time, meaning that the, the line drawn between the sun and the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times, right? Now, what I'd like to do now is describe how this works in terms of, uh, well, let's say, oh, wait, why did it? So shapes, arrow, there we go. I want to talk about how this how this works basically in terms of um, the type of physics we've learned so far. So we have this object, and it has a velocity vector that points tangent to the path, right? So it's got some velocity right here, v. And it moves to some new location over here where it has a new velocity. And let's put in another arrow right here. Let's see, I wonder if I just immediately, and now its velocity is going to again be tangent to the path like that. Um, maybe we call that velocity v prime or something. And let's say that the planet has a mass. That, so the, the mass of the planet here is going to be um, m sub p. 
So it moves from this location to this location. That has this velocity vector here and then v prime right here. That's also a vector. And it sweeps out some area during that time, right? Now, we need to investigate the forces acting on this object if we want to understand something that's happening here. The only force that's going to be acting on the planet is the force of gravity from the sun, right? The force of gravity from the sun. So let's draw that in here. The force of gravity from the sun is going to point that way in that case. And then the force of gravity from the sun is going to point back this way in this case, right? And I really should probably make it that that one's shorter because it's getting farther away, right? But they both point along that line, and that represents the force of gravity. Now I need one other vector in here, and I've kind of already got it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw a little green arrow there and a green arrow there and say that those represent the position of the object. So it starts off at some position that we call our initial and it moves to some position that we call our final. Right? And, and now we're actually able to draw another vector on here. I hope this doesn't clutter the diagram too much, but uh, let's draw a vector from here to there. And I'm going to call that vector dr. Yep, dr. And I'm also going to say that we define the area inside of here. We're going to call it DA for a reason that will become clear in a second. And we're going to say the time interval to go between these two points is going to be DT. All right. Now I want to point something out about this system right here. The sun exerts a force on this object, right? But it doesn't exert any torque. So the force of gravity... zero external torque on the system. Whoop, why did it do that? Oh, I'm on easy shape. Uh, zero external torque. Can anyone tell me why I know that from this picture here? It's a closed system. Hey, here you go, Ash. That's exactly what I was thinking about, by the way. Exactly. Kenny said the same thing, and so does the physics nader. Exactly, yep. The force is parallel to the lever arm. It points along the radius, etc. Yeah, exactly. This force is basically opposite to the direction of the this, right? And remember that, like, you know, torque would be equal to uh, R cross FG, but if they are parallel to each other, as you guys say, the torque due to gravity is going to be zero. Okay. So why did I mention that? Why did I mention that gravity exerts zero external torque? What do we know about systems when the external torque is zero? Exactly. The angular momentum is conserved, right? The angular momentum is conserved. So we know in this case that basically angular momentum has to be conserved. And that's really all I wanted to prove. But we're going to go a little farther and we're going to prove um, the, um, the second Kepler law, okay? So how do we do that? Well, if we know angular momentum is conserved, we can say the angular momentum of my planet is going to be equal to uh, at least initially, it's equal to r sub i crossed with the momentum of the object, right? Eh, p initial. Maybe, maybe we call this v initial and we call this v final just so we can be consistent. And that quantity, right, is going to be equal to uh, r initial cross product with m times v. And if I, um, let's see, what do I need to do next? How do we get the DT in here? Okay, so this is R sub I crossed with, uh, and we can pull the mass out in front. Um, v is basically dr dt, right? It's the rate of change of the, the position vector. All right. And now we end up getting something inside of here that's, that's worth mentioning something about this picture here. All right, so if I take ri cross dr dt, how can, I, how can I visualize what that actually represents? Um, I would say that it has something to do with the area. I would say that if I take ri and I take the cross product of that with dr, 
I'm going to argue that that's equal to dA, and I'm going to give you an analogy as to why that's the case. So suppose that I take two vectors. And I really want to do it like this, actually. I really want to put them tail to tail. So in our picture, they kind of look something like this. Like, this is r sub i. And if I put them tail to tail like this, this would be dr. OK? Really, all I'm doing is I'm taking that vector and I'm just shifting it over to here, right? Um, we, could even, we could even copy it if we want to and say that shapes click, shapes. <laughs> Won't let me. I'm basically taking. Uh, stop it. Yeah, I'm moving dr over to here. That kind of looks like dr, right? When you do this, you basically form a parallelogram. Okay, and I'm going to draw it over here. The parallelogram you form looks something like. Oh no. It looks something like this. This side is still dr, and that side's r sub i, right? Now, suppose this angle here is phi, all right? And I say, what is r sub i crossed with dr equal to? Well, it's basically equal to r multiplied by dr, and then multiplied by the sine of the angle between the two of them, right? But I would argue that when you do that, you've basically said, I drop a perpendicular line from here to here. Oh god, that looks awful. I drop a perpendicular line from here to here so that that's a right angle. And this angle inside of here is phi. Let me indicate that right here. The angle inside of here is phi. Then I would argue that dr sine phi is basically equal to the height. It's ri, right? And if it's equal to the height, then this quantity is basically equal to the area of this entire thing. You know what I mean? So if I do ri cross dr, it's basically area. But in this case, I'm calling that area da. It's the area of this little thing right here is da. So we can rewrite the thing on the right-hand side to say that the angular momentum, if I remove the vector symbol, is equal to m ri cross dr is going to give you da. And then you divide that by dt. Except there's a problem here because my da is actually only half of it, right? So really, it's going to be this divided by 2. Because the whole thing is cut in half, right? Or this thing divided by 2 is equal to dA, I guess, is the way to say it. My bad. Yep. Wait, is that right? This whole thing divided by 2 is equal to what we call dA. So the 2 actually is in the wrong place, right? dA should be 2 times dA? Yeah, I was going to say that looked wrong to me. This thing should be... Oops. This should be times 2. So we end up getting that um, dA dt is equal to, what is it equal to? It's equal to 2 times the angular momentum of the planet divided by the mass of the planet. dA dt is equal to a constant. And that's Kepler's second law. because it tells you something about the rate of change of the area, right? If you think about what Kepler's second law states, it's that would the line integrals make more sense if you were in 220 right now? This isn't an integral, first of all, but I would say maybe. You know, it's possible. I mean, I don't know, though. can't be sure. Is it one half that I put the two in the wrong place? I'm sorry. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, you're right. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's LP over 2 divided by mass, right? This is considered to be a... Oh, no. I didn't mean to do that. This whole thing right here is considered to be a constant of uh, the motion in times of the planet. You haven't even got to line integrals yet, so no. Yeah, so what I've heard about 220 is that, like, all the physics stuff is at the very end or something like that. And then when you do get to it, there's not enough time to cover it or something. I don't, I don't understand how, like, these classes, like, are supposed to cover topics. And then, like, they rush them at the end. Like, if I did that in physics, like, you guys would hate me. Maybe you already hate me, I don't know. But either way, you hate me more. You just started line integral today. And probably the line integrals you're doing are more complicated than what we're doing, too. Like, if you think back to how we started this, uh, this line integral we did right here, 
it was super simple because it basically it started as a line integral but in the very next line it's no longer a line integral right you see what i mean like the dot product's gone and, and in physics this is usually what we do actually just so you know because in um 1c you're gonna see something like this related to voltage and basically we just instantly get rid of the dot product we do the same thing with surface integrals with gauss's law da -da 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 -da. So, eh, Kepler's second law, we've proved it there, right? My god, this is taking so long. I want to do at least one problem today. We're going to do this problem right here. Alright, Comet Norm orbits the Sun in 100 years. At its near point, it is traveling 29 kilometers per second and just grazes the Earth's orbit. At its far point... Find the distance from the sun and its speed. Let's draw a picture of this. So we've got a comet, okay? And it's on a very elliptical orbit. And the sun... Please, why now? <sighs> cool. All right. All right, one note. So here's the sun. Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. I just I just want to click this guy, and I want to put a sun right there. So there's the sun. Uh, we have a comet that's traveling around, and what we know is some information about the comet. So here's the comet when it's uh, close to the sun. I don't know if you know this, but comets' tails point away from the sun, because it's like basically this gas that's coming out of them. Here's the comet when it's uh, far away from the sun over here. And what we know is that it's, it orbits the sun in 100 years. Okay, that's its period, right? The period is called T. So 100 years is the period. Uh, it's near point. It's traveling at 29 kilometers per second and just grazes the Earth's orbit. So what we know is that when it gets to here, uh, it's going to have a velocity vector like this. And that velocity, we'll call it like V1 or something, is equal to 29 kilometers per second. All right. And when it gets to this location, we learn from Kepler's third law, we know that it's going to be moving very slowly when it gets to this point. So we'll call this one V2. And we don't know what it is, okay? We know a couple other things here, though. Let's just draw a line across this so that we can represent some distances. No, stop it. I have to click shapes, line. All right. So let's put a line that goes through the system like that and pull it over to here. And then we're going to state that uh, if we break this line up into two parts at the, where the sun is, um, we're going to define the distance out to this point right here. We're going to call that distance R2. And we're going to call this distance R1. Okay, so R1 goes from there to there, right? And R2 is the rest of the distance. From there all the way out to there. Okay. We don't know what those values are, but we do know what R1 is, okay? It says that it just grazes the Earth's orbit when it's uh, at its at its close distance here, right? So that basically means that R1 is equal to the distance from the Earth to the Sun, which we call 1 AU, which is approximately equal to 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. I can't remember if we need to convert things in this problem. We probably do. So That's its close, because it says it just grazes the Earth's orbit. That would be the orbit around the Sun, right? Not that it just grazes the Earth, but it grazes the, the orbit itself. So that's our picture, and we want to figure out um, at the far point over here, uh, its distance from the sun, so that's going to be R2 that we want to find, and we also want to find its speed, so that's V2, okay? So basically part A is R2 and part and, and the velocity is, is it's a part B, okay? So, to solve this problem, um, we need to kind of think about what's happening. For orbits, there are two things that we know. Energy is conserved and angular momentum is conserved. These are conserved quantities. That means that the energy of the orbit at point one, mechanical energy, has to be equal to the energy of the orbit at point two, and the angular momentum of the orbit at point one has to be equal to the angular momentum of the orbit at point two. Okay? Let's use these two equations. Let's do angular momentum first. So L1 equal to L2. This one's really simple. 
The angular momentum of this object, if we say that it has a mass m, is basically just its mass times its velocity at that location times the distance r1. And this is because, well, it's at a right angle here and here. So you multiply by sine 90, but we don't need to do that. Its angular momentum, when it gets to this location over here, is just going to be its mass times v2 times r2. The masses cancel, and this becomes basically v1 uh, times r1. We, both, we know what both these quantities are, is equal to v2 times r2. All right. What about the energy equation? Now, the energy equation is quite a bit more complicated. For the energy equation, E1 is equal to E2. We have to take into account its kinetic energy plus its potential energy and say that that's equal to its kinetic energy over here plus its potential energy. Do we need this equation, though? I don't know. We have two unknowns, right, in this equation over here. And I know for a fact we can use energy in this case. But looking back at the given information and knowing that this equation is going to get quite complicated, what can we use this information to find? That's exactly right. Which one? Which Kepler's law? It's the third law, right? If we know the period, right? We also know. So let's let's not use this equation because we could. We absolutely could. It's another way to do it. But since we know what the period is, and we know the period squared is related to the semi-major axis cubed, we could find the semi-major axis, right? Now, what is the semi-major axis? Do you guys remember? It's basically this distance. I don't want to. I don't know if I should write it on here. But if I if I call that the center then A, the semi-major axis, is basically this distance from there, from the center to the edge of the orbit, basically. That's A, the semi-major axis. And there's there's something that goes inside of here, and I always forget what it is, but I think it's I think it's this. It's 4 pi squared. We, we derived this last time. Divided by G times the mass of the sun. Right? Isn't that what that is? Okay. Look at your equation sheet and make sure that's right. Mine's underneath some stacks of paper. I think that's correct. So, no, I'm checking. Can you guys check for me and make sure that's right? Because I always flip it upside down sometimes. It's, yeah, t squared, 4 pi squared, yeah, looks right. Okay, so we can solve for a, right? So let's do that. So let's see, a is going to be equal to t squared divided by 4 pi squared times g times ms, and we just need to raise all of that to the one-third power, basically. Don't do that very often, but it's a kind of a weird equation, right? So let's plug in our numbers. Now, um, this is where I want to do this in AU almost, but yeah, that's okay. We just plug the numbers in. So 100 years, we're going to have to convert to um, seconds, right? I guess we'll do this off of the other side. So 100 years, we would multiply by, what is it? Um, one year is 365.25 days. One day, I think in a day you have 3,600 times 24, which I think is 86,400 seconds in a day. Is that right? Let me, all you have to do is take 60 times 60 times 24, basically, right? Is that like right? Yeah, okay, 86,400. So how many seconds is that? So we take that times 365. I think it's going to end up being... Um, I think in a year there's 3.5, 3.1, yep. And you multiply that times 100. So t is basically equal to 3.15 times 10 to the 9, or 3.16 times 10 to the 9 seconds. Okay. So we just plug that into our equation. Okay, this is where uh, your uh, the EE button, the scientific notation on your button, button on your calculator is going to be very handy for this one. So you do this times 10 to the 9 seconds, and that's squared. Um, times g, which is 6.67, times 10 to the negative 11. And then mass of the sun. You can look this up in a table, but it's 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Pretty easy to remember. And we divide this by 4 pi squared. And then all of that 
is going to be raised to the one third power of the cube root. And let's pull up. Um, Was there a question? That's someone typing. Is that going to go? Okay, I put this right here. Connecting. Can you guys calculate that for me? You really got to practice putting stuff like this in your calculator because it's the kind of stuff that you just got to get kind of good at. So what is it? So it's 3.16. Which button? What button are you talking about? Ash? Okay. 3.16 times 10 to the 7. No, 10 to the 9. We got to square that. And then times 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Where's the negative sign? Oh, no. Negative 11 times 2e30. Divide 4, divide pi, divide pi. And then we take that 3.4 times 10 to the 37, and we raise that to the 1 divide 3. Yeah, it's, it's a different button on everybody's calculator. It's a different button on everybody's calculator, by the way. So on this button, it's this EE button right here. On a TI, it's something similar to that, usually above the comma key. You push second and then comma. And then on uh, Via's calculator there, it's the EXP button. It's on there on every calculator. You have to be able to, to use scientific notation, right? And that's what you get. So you guys got the same thing as me. It looks like 3.2 times 10 to the 12th is what A is. So we get that the semi-major axis in this case is 3.12 times 10 to the 12th. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Jose. Exactly. It's right above the comma key. Yep. Um, I, I really want to emphasize how much, how much better it is than doing other things. You notice that in this equation here, I, I didn't use, I didn't use any parentheses, not even for the the square the squared part, right? I just I just said this number, this whole thing it treats it it thinks this number is the, is no different than the number two hundred or something like that, right? Yeah, you were living in the dark ages. Thanks for being honest about that. That's how I feel too. Like once I understood actually how it works, it is it is very freeing. It will help you with your chemistry classes, your math classes, everything, as long as there's actual numbers in it. Although I don't think your math classes often have numbers. Anyway, so that's our semi major axis. Okay, but let's think about what we were trying to do here. What were our, our things we were trying to solve for? We were trying to solve for R2 and V2, right? And we knew the value of R1, and now we know the value of A. Can we use that, R1 and A, to find something else now? Can we solve for, maybe for example, for this? What would it be equal to? What's R2 equal to? We've got A down there. Oh, it has units too, right? Um, 2A minus R1, right? So we can say, basically, if I take R1 plus R2, that's basically equal to double the semi-major axis because the semi-major axis is only half of the orbit, right? So uh, that means, as you guys said, 2a minus r1 is equal to uh, r2. So r2 is going to be 2a, so 2 times 3.12 times 10 to the 12 meters, and then minus r1, which is um, it was given as basically the 1au, which is 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. And you end up getting 6.3 times 10 to the 12. Is that right? Do you guys agree with that statement? What would it be? 2 times this would be 6.1. Oh, that can't be quite right. Six point one sounds more correct to me, yeah. I mean I'll do it, I guess, but so we go back to our calculator here. Um, clear that. No, I didn't want to do that. Wait. No, what are you doing? Can I? Oh, dang. So it's basically 3.12 uh, times 10 to the um, 12. And then we said, oh, times 2 minus 1.5 times 10 to the 11. 1 equals. Yep, cool. And that's going to be in meters, right? So we now have R2. That's really handy. That was the answer to part A. Notice that we only got that because we knew something about the period. So we have the period, and we said, oh, I know the period. That's related to uh, the semi-major axis cubed. It's related to something about the orbit. It's one of the 
fundamental connections that has allowed us to understand how planets orbit. And now if I want to find um, if I want to find what the value of v2 is, the velocity that the object has when it gets over to here, I can just use that equation, right? So we put that down here. And we say, okay, well, I know what r2 is now, so v2 is just going to be equal to v1 times the ratio of r1 over r2. And that's going to be, uh, you think v1 was 29 kilometers per second, was given in the problem, but that's the velocity when it's close to the sun. And we just multiply by r1. r1 was 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. And r2 is this, so 6.1 times 10 to the 12 meters. And we get that v2, it's going to be really small. I think it's going to be something like 0 0.6 something uh, kilometers per second. I think it's 2, 1. Does that look right to you guys? Nope, not quite right. I don't know where I got that number from. There you go. It's very slow by comparison, right? I mean, it's extremely slow. All right, do you guys have any questions? Does that make sense? Convert the units, like for this guy right here. Um, because we're multiplying a number, times a ratio, it doesn't matter, because this has units of one, so the n cancels out, yeah, exactly. Anytime you have a ratio, you don't need to worry about the units. It's one of the things that's amazing about proportionality relationships, is they don't require units. Okay, does that all make sense to you guys? Now, I'm not going to do it, but you definitely can solve it using this too, just so you know, just so you know. Now, I know for a fact that you guys have a problem that's like this on your homework, okay? But is a little trickier, and I want to I wanna warn you about that now. On your homework, you're supposed to do something like very similar here. But the difference is it does not tell you, I hope you guys are paying attention right now, it does not tell you that, that the velocity that you're trying to find is at the apoapsis. So this is called the apoapsis over here, right? Or the ap aphelion. Basically, the difference in the problem that you guys are going to do is the velocity is going to be somewhere else. It's going to be somewhere not at the same location. Okay? Um, and the biggest thing you have to take away from that is you're not going to know the value of the angle between these two vectors right here, which means that you, you I think that you're not going to be able to use this equation. Because without knowing the angle, you won't be able to properly write down the angular momentum equation. I'm sure you will all forget about that. I'm going to repeat it one more time. You have a pro problem in your homework that's very similar to this, except you're not allowed to use this because it doesn't tell you the angle. So don't make that, that assumption. You know what I mean? And because you can't use this, you have to use the energy. Okay? It's recorded. <laughs> that's right. It's recorded. I can tell you which problem it is after class B or something like that. Okay, so that is going to be all for now. Um, I might show you guys some stuff with Kerbal real quick, um, but I'll have something more prepared for next time regarding that. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.